Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's CITI program webinar. Today's topic is data management and security for student researchers, and it is presented by Mariette Marsh. Let me tell you about today's presenter. Mariette Marsh is an Assistant Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Safety at University of Arizona. She has over 20 years experience in academic research. Currently, in her role at University of Arizona, she oversees conduct of human and animal research, HIPAA privacy, radiation and chemical safety, and auditing. She has served as the IRB director for over 10 years and has previously served as the HIPAA privacy officer. Mariette regularly consults on security and ethical considerations for data protection. So our learning objectives today is to define the basic principles governing protection of research and the confidentiality of research data. And um, there's a lot that actually goes into that to kind of give you the framework. Then we're also going to identify some best practices for um, you to use in storing and securing research data. And then last, there might be situations that um, are where you have unique data or unique research projects where you need to actually ensure that um, there are extra protections in place. And we're going to discuss that as well. What the IRB must find related to your unique individual research project. And one is that risks are minimized to subjects, which includes sound research design that do not necessarily or unnecessarily exposed subjects to research risk. And when, uh, I want you to think about risk in the framework of using data and securing data as we think about risk. And then also another component of the IRB approval process is when appropriate, the IRBs must ensure that your research projects have provisions to protect the privacy of subjects, as well as maintain the confidentiality of data. On top of the criteria for IRB approval, there are actual, as I mentioned, informed consent requirements that go into um, the consent document. One is a statement describing the extent to which confidentiality of records will be maintained. And it says, if any, because there are research projects and there are legitimate reasons when records identifying subjects could be disclosed, identifiable information could be disclosed. And again, so long as the subject agrees to those terms, that's that free informed consent, then it would be fine for you to share that information in the manner you said you would. In addition to the IRB requirements, so the common rule, the role overseeing human research activity uh, for protection of um, data and confidentiality and telling subjects about um, their information, the NIH is coming out with a new policy. It's effective January 25th of 2023, and it's a new uh, data sharing and management policy requirement. So any research project that receives NIH funds must submit a data management and sharing plan that outlines the science, how you're going to um, share any data and metadata that goes along with it. Are you going to manage and share um, that information? And in particular, they are asking that researchers place this information into a public repository. Of course, that has to take into account any restrictions or limitations you might have told your subjects or that the IRB has placed upon your research project. But they, um, uh, the NIH is of the mindset that public dollars have been used for uh, research activity. Therefore, the broad, um, de-identified as much as possible data sets should be available for public use as well. Uh, the National Science Foundation, NSF, has had a data sharing and management policy in place for some time. So if you, you know, down the line, get future funding from NSF, that's already been a requirement. But the so historically, we have, um, you know, the old way that we collected data and stored data was on paper documents stored in a locked file and cabinet in a locked office, right? And the investigator has the key in their pocket with them at all times. And, you know, thumb drives were used prolifically, right? Excel spreadsheets were on thumb drives and those Excel spreadsheets, you just plug into any computer on your thumb drive and share it amongst your colleagues or email it and attach it. That is not um, a reasonable way to conduct and store, uh, collect and store your data moving forward, given the tools that we have at our disposal. I can give an example from a researcher of mine who, um, she did exactly that. She had four data sets on a thumb drive and she went to a conference 
And at the conference was her PowerPoint presentation and she plugged her, her conference or her, her thumb drive in and, and at the conference, she did her talk and everything was great. She left her flash drive behind. That flash drive, as I said, had four data sets that were completely unsecured that contained 100% identifiable information on psychosocial behavioral outcomes for um, a very vulnerable population. That was a huge mess that we had to fix as an institution, but it is an example of how easy you can leave a flash drive behind with valuable information on it. And so I do know that there are certain types of data collection tools that are still on paper because of copyright issues. I do know that there are certain um, data collection methods that still require you to do things um, on paper. If you do have paper, uh, the question then becomes is, can you scan it and store it? And is there a, an appropriate policy that allows you maybe to destroy that paper if necessary, or do you need to keep it as a source document for your research project? But storing it in a filing cabinet in a locked office away, you know, quote, away from everyone really isn't how we're doing research. Understand the risks to the research participants and what that disclosure of their data might mean. I think researchers inherently, um, many researchers inherently walk into their project with a little bit of a bias about, of course, this is going to be good. This is going to be a great research project. We're going to find out all these wonderful things. And you may forget that. Um, these are volunteers. Uh, ideally, these are uh, people that have volunteered to help you, and they're sharing sensitive information with you, whether it be um, information, you know, maybe you're working in a country where uh, speaking up against the, the local government is wrong. Maybe you work in a country where um, women and children don't have the same freedoms that they maybe do here in the United States. Maybe you're working in a country where um, men talking to women or women talking to men is inappropriate um, and could get them in trouble. There's all sorts of potential cultural considerations that add risk. And by you having a document, whatever that document may be, increases that risk. So you have to be aware of that. Again, there's generational and the cultural factors I discussed. And when you're talking um, in your informed consent document, please be clear about the data security measures you really plan to employ. Um, this is an area that, I, as we discussed, there's regulatory language that's required. But I don't think the general public understands what encryption means. I don't think the general public understands um, what a cloud server or a cloud drive is. And so you may you know, spit it out that says, oh, I'm gonna store it on, on, on the cloud and it's gonna be secure and encrypted. You may actually have to go back and describe that in more detail because your participant may not understand. Most importantly, do what you say you'll do um, in the informed consent document and know your institution's data security policies. I think many of the questions I get, particularly from our student researchers, is, well, you know, my consent form said I do this, but I really want to do that. And the answer to that is you can't, because that's not what you told your subject you would do. You said you were going to de-identify all of the information and not share it with researchers or colleagues. But now you want, you have a colleague that you want to collaborate with and you want to share the information and maybe recontact those participants and gather additional data. That's not what your consent document said. And so the, oh, there's two ways you can go about that for the most part. One is you can't do it. Or two, you go back and you reconsent your subject for that future use, um, potentially future identifiable use of their information because it is their information that you are using ultimately. Knowing your institution's data security policies is key. And if you don't have an institution that has strong data security policies, really you need to look at what's best practice. You need to talk to your peers. Um, you, I'm sure every institution has some sort of inf information security office or officer that you could talk with. Um, and I think you need to use good common sense. You know, do you let people access your bank information? Do you let people access your social security number? Um, research data should be viewed equally the same unless the subject has told you otherwise that it's okay to use it.
I also invite everyone to review our content offerings regularly as we are continually adding new courses and webinars in various areas of research, ethics, compliance, and professional development.